Bingo, we're back. Think Tech on a Monday. Oh, Monday, Monday, Monday. Okay, and we're doing Life After Statehood with Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, informed citizen. Hi, Ray. <laughs> Good to be here after Thanksgiving. Of course. Have you recovered? Oh, well, I'm, I'm fine. I, I don't eat that much. <laughs> okay. I spent the whole weekend working on Think Tech stuff, so it's okay with me. All right. So it's a working, uh, working Thanksgiving for you. Exactly. We're, every weekend's a working weekend. <laughs> So uh, let's talk today in our life after statehood examination about transportation okay. in Hawaii. And before the show began, you were telling me, um, you know, some very interesting stuff about, you know, the, the, Hawaiian, the Hawaiian experience with transportation, starting from Captain Cook. And you revealed to me, which I did not know, and I don't think many people know at all, is that prior to Captain Cook, the Hawaiians did not have the wheel. That's correct. Uh, the, the, uh, the wheel didn't really exist here, but they had great experience in uh, sailing, you know, with the canoe, of course, and uh, the catamaran, and uh, they had extensive uh, inter-island voyages. And when you, we, we with say, canoes. Yeah, with canoes, and when we say inter-island, it went all the way up uh, northwest of Kauai to those uh, uh, sh atolls and little island islets there, and stretching all the way to South Point on the island of Hawaii. And they were good at it. Uh, they were very good at it. But on the other hand, uh, as you know, um, they developed their own island cultures, and, and uh, some, in some instances, they were raiding uh, other villages, other islands. It's not like it was one whole state or uh, confederacy or kingdom and uh, that's a mistake when you say that about uh, life before 1778 when Captain Cook came. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, Kamehameha um, had a big battle on the Pali and all that which uh, consolidated most of the islands except Kauai as I remember. Um, what role did uh, the transportation play in that? Well, before um, uh, the British or Westerners came to Hawaii, uh, they could, of course, uh, uh, have catamaran uh, voyages among the islands, but it was not large-scale uh, kind of transportation. What the English and British uh, brought were larger ships, and, uh, and also when the Hawaiians saw these ships, they accelerated making larger catamarans, larger ships on their own also. So and the death of Captain Cook was around a... A longboat. A yes, longboat. Yes, the uh, Hawaiians wanted his longboat. He said no. So they... And, and, and it was a... a in, in those days, uh, it was called a misunderstanding that led to a riot and, and firing of muskets and the death of Captain Cook. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. So uh, it was around a small boat, in fact, when this so-called misunderstanding uh, uh, arose. And that ended the life of, of the British leader at that time. Now, in the group was, um, many think, was uh, the young Kamehameha, that he witnessed uh, the killing of Captain Cook. And he saw the ships come in, and he saw the, uh, the value of uh, uh, such ships uh, to take other islands. That's, I think that was a catalyst. That's uh, a military uh, as weapon. A, uh, yes, that it, it all fell into his uh, long-range plan to consolidate first the island of Hawaii, then to move to Maui, and then the other smaller islands, uh, Lanai, Molokai, and then to Oahu. And when he brought his uh, military um, uh, amphibious campaign <laughs> to, like Normandy, to uh, Oahu, <laughs> he had assembled a whole series of, of uh, larger ships uh, through his... Uh, larger canoes. Uh, well, larger ships. Uh, he had uh, one or two uh, uh, sailing vessels that uh, he uh, kind of kind of uh, uh, got alliances with traders and with Isaac Davis, with John Young, with people like that. These were English-style sailing. That's right, that's they right. They were not uh, Hokulea. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And he brought over 12,000 warriors to the, uh, the island of Oahu, and I made a kind of a, a, an analogy of the military campaigns of that era. In, 1770, uh, in 1781, when the Revolutionary War in North America be between Great Britain and uh, the, the 13 colonies ended at Yorktown, uh, Lord Cornwallis surrendered the entire British Army, which was 8,000 soldiers and, and Marines. Uh, so, um, uh, so King Kamehameha had the wherewithal to develop logistics to move large numbers of, of uh, men, material, food, um, um, uh, muskets, uh, and, and of course uh, powder and, and all kinds of weapons to another island. He was remarkable in, in, in the space of, what, um, 
15 Le years. 15 barely 15, years. Uh, barely 15 he years. He picked uh, up all the accoutrements of right. Western society and used them effectively in consolidating the state. And, uh, well, uh, and that's what he did, uh, the kingdom. Now, next stop, you absolutely right, was Kauai. And if, but if you look at the map of the Hawaiian Islands, the farthest uh, uh, island from another island is Kauai. It's over 70 miles from uh, Oahu. And uh, he was ready to uh, step up for another campaign, but he had to uh, suppress uh, uprisings and uh, all kinds of political infighting back on the island of Hawaii and other parts. So he delayed that. And uh, Kauai eventually, under the king, um, uh, kind of acceded to be part of the kingdom. That didn't take place until like 1820. Uh, is that right? Uh, a long time. And uh, that is why uh, even today there's a, a history by Ed Jostin uh, 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 about Kauai, and it's entitled The Separate Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you have this very rich history which, which gets a, a, a real boost by Captain Cook's arrival of navigation, of transportation. I don't remember Kamehameha had a, the rule of the broken, the, ru, the law of the broken paddle. And the law of the, and, and Hawaii Bicycling League, and uh, Chad Taniguchi talks about this all the time, was that everyone has a right to the road. And what's a little bit chilling about that is that until he announced this law of the broken paddle, um, not everybody <laughs> had a right to the road, and some people couldn't go on the road. Um, but after that, it was a sort of democratization of the roadways. Um, I think they were a little late in terms of you know global development, but there you have it. Well, so it was uh, an advance, though. Well, that I think did that. I think you have an interesting point there. If you go back to the late uh, 18th century. And if you went to, say, um, uh, you know, uh, Kaka'ako or Waikiki back then and saw a Hawaiian person and say, who are you? Where are you from? He would probably not say, I'm from Hawaii. Uh, he, would, he or she would say, I'm from the Ahupa. Uh, that, that's, that's the area that he or she lived and died and worked and, and, and got fish or food and so forth. That stretching from the top of the mountain all the way to the sea, that yeah. ecological ecosystem yeah. uh, was the, the that was his home. world that, uh, uh, that was the citizenship of yeah. that person, yeah. not of Oahu. Yeah. Uh, that person probably could not go. Uh, he would have been beaten or, or, you know, uh, or uh, ostracized or kicked out if he went to Waianae or, or even to Waimanalo. And, and so the, those, those little visitors existed, uh, self-sustainable, and exchanged, you know, like mangoes from the interior with fish from, you know, the coast. So they were uh, kind of an ecosystem, but they would not have said, I'm from uh, the kingdom of Hawaii at that point. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's interesting that, uh, you know, over time through the 19th century, the formative period um, for the, um, you know, synergistic development of the Hawaiian culture and, and people from elsewhere, um, the, Hawaiian, the Hawaiian canoe didn't go anywhere, really. Um, it was the larger ships that but came from the mainland and from Asia that really meant... And by the, by the end of the 19th century, um, it sounds to me like uh, transportation was um, not really a Hawaiian experience anymore, uh, although they could regulate it, certainly. But it was uh, the capital, the know-how was coming from somewhere else, especially inter-island and between the islands and the mainland and Asia. No? Uh, that's right, and you have um, some um, uh, travel uh, uh, between the islands, like, uh, as you know, up till the 1850s and 60s, Lahaina was the capital of the kingdom. So during some parts of the year, the whole royal court would have to travel from Honolulu to Lahaina. So that was a big uh, endeavor to do that. So they had to gather a lot of canoes, a lot of vessels to do that. But uh, what really accelerated all this was uh, the clipper ship. And the clipper ship would uh, take uh, cane, uh, sugar cane, to, uh, or molasses, or what? what sailing yeah, ships. Sailing ships, large sailing ships, uh, as, uh, used as uh, freight, uh, coming to, um, bringing goods to Hawaii from uh, San Francisco and so forth, and then going back with uh, molasses or cane or whatever the uh, product was of, of sugar cane at that point to pay for all these products. Now, e now I've heard that even uh, rich planters sent their um, 
uh, their their laundry to San Francisco. <laughs> that they, that, but that gives you an idea how dependable the clipper ships were uh, yeah. uh, uh, becoming in terms of mail and, yeah. and so forth. And then steamships would come about by the, uh, after the Civil War. They would start coming in and out uh, of uh, you know even more dependable uh, because they could you know. Uh, uh, go when there's no wind uh, yeah. between. So uh, uh, that that activity accelerated uh, exports out of uh, Hawaii to the mainland. Yeah, and in terms of inter-island uh, traffic, um, we had those uh, the steamships plying the inter-island trade with the cargo and passengers. Uh, from then, uh, would be about uh, the last the last 25 years or so of the 19th century, right through, mm, gee, statehood. Right. That's how you got around, because uh, air flight before yeah. statehood was really of no Nothing, great yeah. consequence. It was an adventure, an experiment, but it wasn't for the people. Yeah? No, and, and this is a very interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, statistically, or percentage-wise, the more people travel between the islands when there were ferries than now when there's one monopoly airline. Isn't that true? <laughs> that is so and, true. And, and, and remember just uh, 10, 20 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, when you had like script, you could buy, you know, a lot of flights of uh, Hawaiian or Aloha and use them like, you know, like sort of getting in and, oh, let's go to Maui this weekend. Let's go to the Hawaii Island or Molokai. And, and, and children used to have grand experiences but today, I would bet, uh, percentage-wide, there are a high percentage of children on the neighbor islands have never been to Honolulu. Yeah, and vice versa. That's right, that's right. So uh, my father, as I said, in the late 30s when he was on Maui, uh, attending Maui High School, he used to be a, a manager for a baseball team, I think, for Maui High. And they used to come to Oahu all the time for, you know, uh, for sports events and so forth, going back and forth. On the steamers. Uh, on the steamers, little tr uh, and it carried freight and so forth. But you see, that that, um, uh, but that is combined with another uh, revolution in population. You have, uh, before the war, there were only 45,000 people on Maui. There's now 165,000 on Maui. How do they eat? How do they do things? How do they, uh, it's all brought in directly from the West Coast sure, sure. on container ships. Directly? Uh, directly. They uh, land directly Yeah, they in, just in come in, Maui. come in. So, but, uh, but you see, the rest of the United States, uh, the ports and so forth, export to Asia, when you think about it. Uh, when uh, items come from uh, China or Japan or South Korea or Taiwan, they go to uh, LA or Oakland or Seattle and they get distributed throughout the US. So when I moved from Tokyo to, uh, to Honolulu, it was cheaper for me to, uh, 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 to send items in a container from Tokyo to LA. And then get them on a the second leg Because back. they had to go another leg yeah. uh, back to yeah. uh, Honolulu. Yeah. So, so it was more uh, expensive for, to get to, although the length of uh, um, you know, distance uh, is, is nearer to uh, Tokyo from Honolulu, and Los Angeles is another you know, uh, leg, leg. But the, because there's nothing that we ship back to Asia, when you think about it, it's empty. <laughs> so it costs more. So in, in that period, say the 50s or so, uh, lots of labor strife on the that's docks. Right, that's right. Uh, the planes really hadn't come. The that's jets right. hadn't come yet. Statehood hadn't happened. Uh, it, it, re it was revealed, I think, that uh, there are very few people controlled all these goods that came from the from the, the from the the, the continent, um, and and that changed the power structure, didn't it? All of a sudden, the waterfront became very powerful. Right. Uh, and the shippers became very powerful. And Alexander and Baldwin arose and others um, controlling all the, and controlling the pricing, controlling effectively the economy. Um, and what's interesting is how statehood affected that. And when we come back from this break, Ray, we're going we're gonna to find out how statehood affected it and how the advent of the regular airlines affected it in inter-island trade and also in trade with, uh, with the mainland U.S., and Asia. Wow, I'm excited to hear about it. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha. See you then. Thank you, Hawaii, Asia in Review. I am Johnson Choi, the host. I'm looking forward to see you next month, December 15, Thursday, 11 o'clock, right here again. Aloha. 
My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. We highlight success stories in Hawaii of both businesses and individuals. We learn their secrets to success, which is always valuable. I hope to see you on our next show. Aloha. back. We're live with Ray Tsuchiyama uh, talking about, uh, you know, the way statehood and the advent of the airlines, which happened right around the same time with jet traffic, um, 1959 or so, changed the docks and the unions that controlled so much of uh, the imports to Hawaii's economy and the exports too, the sugar exports, um, and, and thus the economy itself. So how did statehood change that? How did the airlines change that? I know that's a mouthful of a question. Yeah, it's a, it's a big uh, uh, question, uh, but you get back to the crux of the economy. Uh, the, the ports were at the key, like the internet of its time, <laughs> because through then, it, it, goods flowed out, goods flowed in. Uh, without shipping sugar or pineapples, uh, you, you were, went bankrupt. Uh, uh, that's all we produced. We didn't manufacture cars or semiconductors or, or phones or, or whatever. It was only agricultural products when you thought about it. So that, that was a key area. Uh, to keep uh, peace on the docks uh, took um, you know, a, a lot of uh, focus by the big companies and became even a government issue. Remember, uh, ILWU was seen as a communist organization at one time, and there were, uh, like you say, strikes for more money and, and, and so forth. But it also uh, was uh, a prelude to more democratization of a society. Uh, unions would play a role in, in, in uh, overthrowing the Republican. Uh, and, uh, the revolution yeah, of the 1950s. Uh, 50, 54, uh, yeah. came Jack Hall, uh, many, many people of that period were part of the Democratic Party. Uh, John Burns could never win an election without union backing and so forth. So uh, the intertwining of uh, societal change but uh, 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 didn't also uh, 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 combine with a change in what the unions didn't see coming, which was tourism, uh, which was fueled uh, and triggered by uh, the 707. 707 suddenly could bring hundreds of people at a time to the airport. And then they would go into Waikiki, and then at that time, there were uh, just uh, the Royal Hawaiians or the Moanas or Hale Kalanis that catered to the upper crust. They came by ship. They stayed for a month, oh, yeah. <laughs> from or a month or two months, on the, and then lounge with the Beach Boys and have a grand old time. And, but these were people from uh, the West Coast or Peoria. They would stay for a week, uh, barely a week, and then they leave on the next plane. They were the on infrastructure at that time. And uh, one of the early people who saw the future was Chin Ho. And the Ilikai is very much a symbol of the, uh, the hotel that catered to a new class of uh, short-term stays, uh, families, and so forth. And that was a revolution uh, of, the, of the 60s of statehood and tourism as a whole industry. Yeah. How did that affect the neighbor islands? It did not affect them as uh, as quickly as uh, uh, as, as Honolulu. Uh, I mean, Waikiki was already a uh, playground for the rich and famous from the 20s and 30s. You know, Bing Crosby's and and the Duke Kawamoku's and the um, uh, all the uh, stars and uh, starlets from Hollywood had discovered uh, Waikiki from from way back. Uh, now, w but what was happening on the neighbor islands was that uh, many people don't uh, uh, understand this, but from 1945, and I mentioned this before, to the 70s, the population of Maui was static. It was 45,000. In fact, people were leaving from Honolulu and so forth. And in the so 60s... The, the plantations were no longer as robust right. as they that's had That's right, and, and people wanted an air-conditioned job, uh, and that's what they found in Honolulu. So uh, AMB started uh, thinking what to do with this land that they got from uh, an acquisition of Matson called Wailea. Wailea didn't exist as a even a uh, name of a locality, it's a made-up name. Yeah. It was Kihei, uh, or oh, McKenna, yeah, uh, yeah, not yeah, Wailea. Yeah, yeah. uh, and Wailea was way down the yeah, road. And yeah, and Kanapali was, was this uh, dense, uh, you know, uh, Kiave place that nobody wanted. And fact began to see maybe we can do something here. So uh, the neighbor islands are unique uh, than uh, Honolulu 
for being more master planned. Uh, when you see the golf courses and so <coughs> forth, uh, both Wailea, I mean, and, and Kanapali. Planned for tourism. Yeah, it, it, yes, exactly, and, uh, for mass tr tourism and the selling of lots and housing and so forth. Because that, you don't make money on golf courses, uh, you make money out of the lots and houses uh, yeah. adjoining the uh, golf courses. Yes. So that's an amenity. So, uh, but the upfront cost would take a lot of money. So, so um, the and Amfax and others uh, began to go into another whole different world uh, other than agriculture. And it was not a, a, um, uh, a, 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 a easy kind of transition because agriculture always fought back because they saw one acre of, of, out of ag, it'll never go back to ag. Yeah. So there one was, way street. There was a, always a tension when I was at Castle and Cook between Dole and Oceanic Properties. Always a tension between uh, 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 the the ag people who wanted to retain ag because they saw why well, tourism is just a uh, fluke. Uh, ag is where it's at and has been for a hundred years. It will, will be the dominant economy. So it was always in flux. But the uh, tourism people, because of uh, the rise in population, uh, the rise in, in, in uh, hotels, and people actually coming here and staying after they came as tourists, and that started in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, and so transportation was really backbone to that. You could take, um, you, everybody would come into Honolulu in those days, and then they would go to the neighbor islands, if at all. Right. A lot of people never went to the neighbor islands. And when, when they went to the neighbor islands, they, in my recollection, they were a minority on the plane. Most of the people on the plane, and, and air flights were really cheap in those days, relative till now. I mean, it was like $15 to go to Maui. It was really cheap, and less than 30 for a round trip. It was something else. And um, you, would, you would take your Azores and your uh, igloo uh, and your beach mat, and you'd take your best half uh, and, and go to the beach on Maui. That was romantic, and a lot of local people did that. It was a regular thing. They saw their families, but they also went as kind of, you know, uh, citizens of the state. They were traveling a lot relative till now. Oh, there was much more interaction. And you know, but, but given today's, uh, you know, lack of travel for most people on Oahu, uh, the next stop after Diamond Head is San Francisco. We have no idea what's happening on the neighbor islands. Isn't that true? Isn't <laughs> it that is true. true. Uh, and, and or, that's because it costs 300 bucks. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, or the economy or politics or the needs of the neighbor islands are completely out of, uh, out of mind for 950,000 residents of, of the state of Oahu, as they say. Uh, but uh, one thing in 1964 that people from Hawaii uh, went to uh, Tokyo for the Olympics. And why I bring this up is like it's a uh, mischances in, in the history. And when they arrived there, they uh, uh, came into a world where they could go to inner uh, Tokyo to the hotel through a monorail. It just started up in 1964, and it's, it's still the World's Fair. Well, no, it was Olympics. Olympics, Olympics uh, 64. Thank you. Yeah, and it's like 52 years ago. It's still there. It's still there and working. Yeah, and, and working. But that stretch, uh, it's not a far stretch. When you think about it, in 64, what if, what if uh, Honolulu had developed a monorail? From uh, Honolulu Airport. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Oh, I'm, I'm sick to Waikiki. think we could have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Waikiki. And in those days, you could go drilling through Lilia, <laughs> drilling through sure. Kalihi, Cheap. just like H1, and just uh, you know, uh, wiped out entire neighborhoods or divided you know neighborhoods or eliminated uh, large section of, like you know Damon Estates, Monolulu on this side, Mapunapun on this side. I mean, the large divisions happen, and uh, people forget about that. But it did, uh, uh, you know, destroy destroy many neighborhoods because Honolulu up till the late 60s was a, was a s small city of neighborhoods. Yes. I mean, you go you know, out to Hawaii Kai, it'd be three or four towns along the way. You go out to Waipahu, it'd be three or four towns, and each one was a separate neighborhood, a separate unit. Uh, but then came the freeways right. in the middle 60s with federal money right. for, quote, I love this, interstate highways, <laughs> right. interstate highways money. And even today, there's signs that right. say interstate, interstate right. highway. It took them a long time to build it, and they replaced it like two-lane dirt roads, which existed around the time of statehood. Now, all of a sudden, we had freeways. And freeways, um, freeways changed things, didn't they? Uh, certainly on Oahu, but also on the neighbor islands. 
Right, and um, I, I think what happened was that um, uh, the the strong got stronger, the weak got weaker. By that I meant uh, Ala Moana became a huge shopping center. The neighborhood uh, shopping centers were, were gone. Uh, Kaimuki, for example, was a thriving business center. It was gone by the 60s and 70s. Uh, and, and it allowed for, the, of course, the development of uh, the uh, suburbs beyond Monolua and with the uh, end of uh, sugar. And so there, there was, uh, so that accelerated easy uh, um, kind of in and out. Uh, but what people didn't understand was that in order to not get into a traffic mess, you had to develop employment centers out in the western suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's easy to say. I mean, all through the 70s and 80s, people were talking about the second city and employment centers. It never came about. It's, it, you don't have that contra flow uh, of people. And so everything is still the engine of economic and business uh, growth is downtown in Waikiki. And that's where people come, and that's what uh, uh, that brings us to you know mass transit and everything else. Yeah, mass transit. Yeah, I think we should probably have a show next time about mass transit. Actually, Ray, it's such it's a huge discussion, and it flows out of this whole thing about Second City. But I would like to add that when the freeways were built, roads were being built all over the islands, right. and I remember on the Big Island, for example, the Mamalahoa Highway did not exist in the 60s and the highway the highway south of Kona going to South Point that didn't exist either that that was a little tiny right. one right. lane road with rock walls yeah. on it take you forever to get to South Point um, if you wanted to go from for example Kona uh, to Kamawela right. yeah, yeah, yeah. or right. Kauai High you had to go all the way right. up on the mountain and right. come down again um, so there were a lot of areas in the state that were unbuilt and right. interestingly enough still are <laughs> The saddle road, I mean, it's right, still, I mean, right. maybe they fixed yeah. it a little, but <laughs> yeah, it's still so. a mess. And Kaina, Kaina Point, <laughs> right. we never paved it. <laughs> right, right. We it's never made a road out. there. It's the end of the world. It's incredible, still. yeah. But uh, I'll uh, just mention one thing, unintended consequences. Saying, uh, and I remember this, uh, what if uh, King Street and Baritania did not go one way? At one point, they... They, they were two-way. Two I remember two-ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then eliminated thousands of small businesses. It eliminated them. That's People, true. unintended consequences. It, it would have been a very different city with little, uh, and it would have been a substance, it would have feed, fed into Kakako. You would have high rises there that would have, uh, uh, that, that would have uh, shopped along those streets, Maritania and King Street. And that's all gone. That's all gone. And yeah. they're busy thoroughways with like deserts. They're like deserts between Ala Moana and where you live. Isn't that true? Yeah. Unintended consequences is another way of saying bad planning or no planning. <laughs> But uh, speaking of planning, we're going to get back to this whole thing about rail and all of the implications and all of the factors and considerations then, way back when, when it was first considered, and along the way, and now especially. And we're going to evaluate exactly why it happened the way it happened, what is happening now, and what is likely to happen in the future. Are you excited to discuss that, Ray? <laughs> well, there's uh, many what-ifs, but you cannot change the past. That's the thing. Uh, but you can uh, create the future. You can create the future. And we're going to talk about the future, because that's the most important thing. Next time we meet here at Life After Statehood. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.